think you're probably looking for some shoes. Hmm, I think it's... No, are you... Good morning. 
Good morning. Welcome to this sacred time and place. This is the Reign of Christ Sunday. It used to be called Christ the King Sunday. It's the end of the liturgical year as we draw our hearts and minds together to begin the road next week towards Christmas, which is a fancy way of saying get online, get your Christmas shopping. I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. Let us go to a new country, a new life. What will we take with us? Our love, our patience, our faithfulness. Where will we find this new country? It is found in our conversations, our relationships, and our openness towards each other. When we leave. Now, and each time the Spirit calls us to be there for one another. Voices United 211. Crown him with many crowns. Maybe you didn't get into the pot drawer and bang around in it like I did. 
But I bet as a kid you did something that you got the evil eye for. You know, kids should be seen and not heard. But the first thing a kid wants to do is take whatever they've got and make a noise with it. And in that sense, I actually think they're better scripture readings than most adults. They actually get it that we are to raise a joyful noise to the Lord. And as adults, we get, well, we're nine months into a COVID pandemic. It's hard. We can't go to church, or there's all these rules when we go anywhere. Why would we want to make a joyful noise? But there are still so many things to give thanks for. Now, I get it. Everyone in their lives go through periods where there is nothing to celebrate. It's hard. You are dealing with grief or loss or unemployment, all those things. But together as a society, we always have to remember there are things worth celebrating. There are things worth getting the, the bowl out and making our joyful noise. So that those who can't can still hear it and know there's something that they can come back to. So I want to celebrate kids today for knowing how to make big noises. I give you permission to go home and make big noises today. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> One of these days I am going to give my niece and nephew kazoos. I'm just saying. My sister's threatened to hurt me. But I think that it's worth remembering we still have the capacity to find those kids within each one of us and to raise that noise to the holy, to God, to let God remember that we know how to celebrate, even in dark times, even when the days are shorter and the nights are longer, we can still celebrate. And I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, this morning I played my uh, pot symphony number one. I guess this is my old symphony number one. I'm doing really well this morning for creating new music. But thank you for going home today and remembering to make a joyful noise of the Lord, because we can. I invite you to join with me for a few moments of prayer. Holy One. We give you thanks that we can make a joyful noise, that we can raise our racket to heaven, and there is someone to hear us and celebrate all the noises we make. We don't always recognize that they're melodic, but you know they come from our heart, and that we sing the song of creation when we raise to you all that we have to celebrate. Be with us this day and evermore. Number 574 in Voices United. Come, let us sing of a wonderful love.
God of ancient story, shine through these words so that we may hear your word afresh, that we may be enabled to see and feel your presence all around us, and that we may know your will for our lives. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Reading the scripture from Ezekiel 34, 11 to 16, and 20 to 24. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all of the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the water courses, and in all of the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountains on the heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep because you pushed the flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up cover over them and one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Matthew 24, 31, 26. When the Son of God comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, that you, are, you that are blessed by my Father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that, you, that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry? or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you. And then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. These are stories that come echoing through generations. They take root and blossom in our hearts when we open ourselves to that wisdom. What a funny 
kingdom church we live in. This Sunday, today, is the end of times for the liturgical calendar. It's the end of the church year. Next Sunday, we start over with the inventively titled Year B. And it's the first Sunday of Advent. We live in an institution that lives in, at the same time, a three-year cycle of years and a calendar that looks to the end times. We look to remember our past and proclaim our future. And then that year is further divided into two large chunks of time that each of them has within them preparatory time, Advent and Lent, Kairos time, Christmas and Easter, and Reflection time, Epiphany and Pentecost. And this is the last, year of Pente or last Sunday of Pentecost. We live all of our lives in a not yet, but still kind of experience. And I, for one, wouldn't have it any other way. We in society are very used to not yet. In fact, I would argue we are too used to it. We always want to seem to hurry along the calendar rather than give time to the events in the here and now. A case in point for me recently, and it always tends to be, is the run-up to Remembrance Day. There was a town in this area that not long ago held its Santa Claus parade, the Sunday, Saturday before Remembrance Day. Many others hold it the Saturday immediately after. Now, I don't often give kudos to our friends south of the border, but at least American Thanksgiving, falling at the end of November as it does, keeps Christmas somewhat in its place. There are other places that do try hard. <coughs> Paisley, for example, does it right with their Santa Claus parade falling on the weekend that Advent starts. Now, they might do it by default because the larger communities tend to be the earlier ones, and the small communities tend to get the leftover Sundays that move into December. But I appreciate that it starts on the first Sunday of Advent. As a whole, we always seem to be in a rush to move on to the next thing, even if the current thing hasn't happened. What happened for Valentine's Day? Oh, we had that just before Christmas. You know, in that first few weeks after Christmas, the Valentine flyers would start. I know people who put up their trees in November and have them down before New Year's Eve. As soon as something has happened, it's time to move on to the next. I've railed on this before, but it becomes increasingly difficult to explain that the 12 days of Christmas start the day of Christmas and don't end the day before. They end with Epiphany on January 6th. Now I suppose Advent calendars have something to do with it, as those little doors always end on the 25th. We actively resist living in the moment. It's very difficult to speak of the season of Christmas or the season of Easter. Singing Christmas carols the Sunday or two after the day of Christmas is fighting the larger societal trends and moving on to the next thing without having to think of the event itself. It is a little bit like fast food. It tastes good, but there's no nutritional value, so you have to move on to the next meal quickly. And then there is Christianity's really interesting seasons. The time of reflection that follows both Christmas and Easter. In the church it's called normal time, but it's never really normal. These are actually the times that require the most work. They're the times of proclamation in our calendar. We build up to our high holidays, we celebrate, and then we preach. And yes, that preaching duty is a duty of each one of us and not just the paid accountable staff in a congregation. It's, it's okay, I'm not going to have a sign-up sheet for preaching for following the service. Now the Gospel reading this morning acknowledges this reality. Jesus did not participate in human experience to do everything for us. Rather, in participating, Jesus showed us we are capable of the same kinds of things he did. Now, the reading is often seen as an example of the judgment of God. 
Are you a sheep or are you a goat? That depends, I suppose, on the angle you have on it. You're the goats where I'm standing. You're the sheep. Sheep slightly under, well, under number the goats. But I think the story is much more about empowerment and encouragement. In the story, we are told what we can do. Feed the hungry, slake the thirsty, visit those in prison. It's good news. I know, it might not sound like pleasant work for some, but the reality is it's not life-threatening. It may be inconvenient, but it's not inhuman. We are not given a high threshold for participation in the life of the divine. There was a story a few years back from Fort Lauderdale that seems tailor-made to this gospel story. A 90-year-old veteran has now been arrested for the third time for feeding the homeless in one of the city parks. The city passed an ordinance banning this practice because it encourages the homeless to use the park and they might make others feel uncomfortable. This is the same Fort Lauderdale that intentionally turns a blind eye to questionable behavior from thousands of young revelers during University of Reading Week. If you're homeless and misbehaving, you're not welcome. But if you come with lots of money, you can misbehave all you like. As someone posted on my Facebook feed, remember, if you camp out for a TV, you're a good consumer. If you camp out for social justice, you're a dirty hippie and you will be beaten. All of this by way of saying, we try and ignore and hide our social problems. We try and ship them to another neighborhood. We try and pretend they're not here, and if they're not here, we don't have to do anything about them. Our post-high holiday periods of reflection in the church are ways of bringing our attention back to the issues at hand. They are intentional ways to make us shine spotlights into our dark places and dark corners to see what is hidden there. Scripture, the life and teaching of Jesus, are ways to hold us accountable to our beliefs. We will probably never see the end times. Now, we will all see our own end times, but no one knows the end times for life in general. It is the not yet of our lives. It will always be the not yet of our lives. We find ways to live into those times, but the effort is for some future event that we proclaim but will never live here. We often try and short circuit this process move on to the next things before the one ahead of us is even complete. But in so doing, we only leave ourselves feeling empty and unfulfilled. But still life goes on, and we need to find ways to live. The not yet of life is accompanied by the still yet of proclamation and living in the moment. The good news is that we are told exactly how to move forward into the future. The end times will probably not come, but what we need to do is not done in the end times. It's done here and now. It's as simple as meeting the needs of being human. It's as simple as helping people we've never met and will never meet in doing things like giving to the food grains bank. It is as simple as communities coming together to help each other when a year's worth of snow falls in 36 hours. And you know that's likely to happen sometime in the next four months. It's as simple as a random casserole on the doorstep for someone who is dealing with grief. It is things we know intimately in a place like Hepworth, where there is community, where there is connection. The scriptures make it easy for us. If it is not the one in Matthew, then it's the one in Micah. And what does the Lord require of you? To seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with the Lord. And if there is a time 
to love kindness it is right now in the midst of this stupid pandemic. Kindness is how we respond to that. We're all at short ends of patience. But in loving kindness, we meet each other in those human places that are important. The year is ending. The calendar year, the church year. It's not so hard to believe this week when we had the snow earlier that we did. It felt like December already rather than November. Another cycle has come to the close. We've walked the same scripture that we've walked before. What lies ahead is not new, but familiar territory. We live in the tension of hope, of, yet, of not yet, but still. Advent comes upon us with darkening skies, but we know that hope is always with us. Even in those days that we cannot see it or feel it, we know and we trust that hope will be there. It is in each of our hands and feet. It is in each of our dreams. The world will turn, and warmth and light and color will again return to the world. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Amen. And having preached on light returning to the world, we know that there is always light that we will never put out. That God is always with us to give us hope in the darkness and to shine like the stars. All right, we're going to try something this morning. I had a chat with Betty, and she said, I really like it when the minister sings this particular hymn because I've been following the minister to get the timing right. <laughs> so I'm going to wander over here to the corner, and I'm going to sing. So bear with me. We didn't practice this at all. It's More Voices 30. It's a song of praise to the maker. <laughs> Oh
advantage of me singing because you didn't have to see me dance. The announcements are at the back of your bulletins. I invite you to take a look down there and make sure that you note those things that are important to you. The one I'd like to highlight is Sunday evening, November 29th. Here's the Peninsula Cluster app will have an Advent kickoff via Zoom at 7 p.m. We can't have a potluck this year, but we can meet to celebrate the beginning of Advent together virtually. The Zoom e email will be coming out uh, shortly, and uh, all of the ministry staff, as well as some volunteers from the cluster, so from Hepworth-Sawell, North Tobamori, will be taking part that evening to begin the walk towards Christmas, and we're looking forward to being able to do that. Next week, Sunday, November 29th, we welcome the Reverend David Jones, who will lead both church services while I am on holidays. Are there other announcements of which I am unaware that need to be highlighted this morning? I would like to share with you, um, finally, a piece of work that has just come down from the General Counsel Executive. For those who wonder what I do with my time, I had 11 hours of Zoom meetings Friday and Saturday as part of General Counsel Executive. And one of the important things they did over Friday uh, as part of our work. Some of you may have seen this in the news, it has reached the news, is that we have issued an apology for our involvement in adoption in the 50s and 60s. And I'd like to read you that apology. The United Church of Canada apologizes for our participation in the separation of mothers from their children. Our role in pressured, coerced, or forced adoptions created a legacy of pain and suffering. We helped create a culture of shame. We express our regrets for our part in denying mothers the right to love and care for their children. We denied mothers the care and support they needed and deserved. We apologize to the women who were not informed of their rights and consequently could not provide informed consent. We recognize that many have suffered long-term harm from these actions. We have heard your stories of grief and deep loss. We have heard how you lived with shame and stigma placed on you by the church and society. We are truly sorry. The children who were adopted were not given the opportunity to know their families and their community of origin. Some were misled or lied to about the circumstances of their birth. We apologize to those of you who struggle to find a sense of identity and belonging, to those who feel torn between two families and communities, to those of you who live with a sense of uncertainty within yourselves. We regret that as a church we have too often neglected the message of our faith, that our bodies and our sexualities are part of the goodness of creation. In our zeal to uphold a rigid system of morality, we help to shape and spread a shame-based code with regard to sexuality which ignored the much more important call of our faith to create communities in which every member is welcomed and valued. We told women that having children outside of marriage was a sin. We supported the removal of children from their mothers and from the communities which could have given them dignity and support. We recognize these practices also affected fathers excluded from their children's lives. We acknowledge the hurt caused to brothers and sisters grandparents, partners, and members of extended families who have shared the pain of their loved ones. Regretting our past history of shaming women, the United Church of Canada commits to examine and challenge all beliefs that promote the shaming of any person, to change our language and practices to better honor the dignity and worth of each human being, to support and celebrate all families that create safety, love, and opportunity for their members, to uphold the values of truth and to, and to openness and encourage healing and reconciliation for everyone affected by adoption. The United Church of Canada sincerely apologizes for our regretful and damaging role in pressured, coerced, and forced adoptions. Now I admit to you, this is a personal road for me. I was adopted in 1967 
and I have had a wonderful experience in that adoption process. But I know very many other stories. These are stories that are painful at times. And reading this apology may give some of you painful memories. It may bring to the surface things you have forgotten. If any of you would like to talk about the apology or share your stories, my phone line, my email is always open. And I encourage you to contact me. You have continued to support the church faithfully. When you are here in times like worship, and for many when they are not here because they couldn't come for a variety of reasons. It's overwhelming to see that support continue when we are struggling in so many ways. And the only words to do justice to your support for this place are thank you and hallelujah.
You fill us with hope, so we would have no more fear, but would boldly reach out and gather up all whom the world has cast aside. With your cups, there are two layers to the top. The top layer has the wafer beneath it, and the bottom layer has the juice. And I invite you to remove your wafer. Jesus gathered together his friends for a last meal. And when they had gathered together around the common table, he broke the loaf, shared it to his friends, and said, every time you come to this common table, think of me. Likewise, they passed around the cup of wine, shouted amongst them, and Jesus said, when you come together at this common table, when you raise a glass, remember me. These are the gifts of God, shared in all time and place at this common table that is not ours. It is not the table of the United Church. It is the table of the Holy. And we come overwhelming gratitude that we are all invited to this common table. And when time has come to an end, and all creation has been reconciled to you, we will gather around the feast in heaven, singing our joy and praise to you, God in community, holy in one. and minds together with me in a time of prayer. From Matthew 5, 3 to 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Dear God, we know we are blessed. We know you have given us more than we could ever have imagined. You have given us people in our lives who we care about more than we could ever say. You have given us love, nourishment, and our very lives. We have been blessed with neighbors around the world who are our siblings in you. As we sit blessed with so much, we also sit with so many people in our world who are suffering, so many who need your help, so many who need your blessing. We ask for your blessing and your healing to those who are sick because of COVID-19. Our prayers for your dear people cannot cease until all are healed and your children stop dying, even as we hear of surges worldwide. We are in need of your blessing as we care for those who are sick. Shield and sustain the nurses and midwives who tend the world night and day in this, the year of the nurse and midwife. We ask for healing for our hearts, especially as we grieve those lost to this terrible disease. Help us hold up a candle signifying the light of abiding care as we celebrate this year the 200th anniversary of the birth of Florence Nightingale. We are grateful for a completed election in the U.S. as the returns and counts and recounts continue. Sustain us. During the transition of political power, we ask that the burdens and sense of exhaustion be lifted for all your children. 
We ask for your hope for a future that serves all people, no matter who they are or from where they come. We pray that divisions are softened, knowing that love eternally prevails over hate. We pray for the transition in Bolivia as a new president is inaugurated. We pray that there also might be peace as new political leaders come into power. We pray that your people might have a blessed future of less division and more love. We pray for your children in the United Kingdom as another recession is likely to occur due to COVID-19. We ask for all those whose lives will likely change dramatically with the loss of income and jobs. We ask for your presence that you might bring a blessing to those who feel they have so little. We pray for peace in Ethiopia as civil war unfolds again, and a nation's people are already spilling over borders for safety. As tensions continue to rise, we pray that somehow you may bring a blessing of peace to your dear people. May anxiety soften, may hope replace division, and restore a community of love in your people. We pray for those lives taken on a horrendous killing field in Cabo de Delgado, Mozambique. Bring the world to action as we hear of the mounting heinous human rights violations in the name of combating militants and opposition forces. We are sickened by the news of ISIS insurgent crimes as they set fire to several villages, beheading people, and chopping their bodies, while women from the villages were abducted. Awaken us to the crime of inaction or too late action, as occurred during the Rwandan genocide over 25 years ago. We pray this is not be repeated. We are so grateful, Lord, for the peace in Armenia, as the Prime Minister announced a peace agreement was signed with Russia and Azerbaijan to end the war. We are so grateful for peacemakers, and we ask for your continued blessing as we seek peace to break divisions in a world filled with so much chaos. We pray for our dear people in Hong Kong, as the remaining pro-democracy lawmakers resigned in protest. We pray, God, that somehow your people might receive the rights they deserve and might be blessed with hope for a better future. God, we know we are blessed, and yet we know there are so many who are in need of your blessing and your infinite peace. Guide us, Lord, that we might have hope for the future while we dwell with you. You alone are our greatest blessing, and in you we find our ultimate peace. Into the space that lies between us, the space that is the spirit, we offer in silence the weight that lies on our hearts that is only known to you. Now we pray with voices united the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Music once more. Voices United 213. Rejoice, the Lord is King.
make a joyful noise. Feed the hungry, slake the thirsty, uphold the oppressed. Go knowing that in our hands and feet are the instrument of God's change, that if our hands and feet do not do this, who will? Go this day knowing you have been called and named in love before you were born, that you are called and named in love always. Go this day in love, hope, joy, and peace, now and evermore.